All right, welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein, your host and ringmaster. My partner in crime, Jimmy Bouchelato, is off for the week, so it's just going to be me, but we have a very, very special guest calling in for one of his first major interviews about his uh, life in the mafia. I'm very excited to, to bring on Richard Cantarella, a former capo regime, as well as a acting underboss of the Bonanno crime family. He is someone that uh, has lived it all, has seen it all, uh, is going to be kind of our gangland tour guide through the crazy uh, Bonanno crime family soap opera that was that organization from, you know, the, the, the late 70s into when he left the mob and went with the, the uh, Team USA and, and testified against his boss, Joe Massino, in the early 2000s. But uh, Richard, thank you so much for, for joining us, and we're so excited to hear your story. My pleasure. Nice meeting you. And uh, so let's just start from the beginning. Um, you came up uh, on the lower east side of Manhattan as a kid and were really surrounded uh, by mob figures, uh, you know, both in your your family and, and then the, the mob guys in your family were, were very tied in, deeply connected to the Bonanno crime family, which kind of uh, set set a path for you to to join that family and then rise through the ranks. Can we kind of I mean, start from when you were a little kid and, and your first exposure to the life of a wise guy? Well, to be honest with you, Scott, I was never really interested in the life. I... Um and growing up, we were surrounded by it, you know, neighborhood guys. Nobody back then, the old timers, never, never, never really um, uh, flaunted who they were or what they were about. But you saw these guys were dressed every day, uh, shirt and tie. Uh, they wore their fedoras and uh, always looked uh, uh, really like they stepped out of GQ. And, you know, you knew them and you respected them. Nobody bothered you to make sure the neighborhood was safe. Uh, uh, and, and I was going to school. I wanted to become a, an illustrator. I like drawing. And uh, I, I wound up gra- graduating from uh, FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology. And I went to a couple of months of the college and I had an argument. And uh, I, to put it a different way, I guess when I left, I took the wrong train. <laughs> and I, I, I wound up, uh, you know, I, I was working in uh, uh, the, the, I, I originally went to the Journal American. I don't know. Do you remember any of these newspapers? Uh, you know, I'm aware of them from, you know, a distance, you know, because I'm not a, uh, a New Yorker. I didn't know them okay. when, when they were being printed. I'm a relatively, you know, okay. younger guy. I'm in my early forties, but, uh, yeah, okay. I'm aware. I'm, I'm aware of the publication. Okay. So I went to work in the Journal American because back then I got a father and son union card. That's how it worked in the newspaper mail delivery union. And through my father, I got a union card. I went to the Journal American. Uh, I wound up, <laughs> you know, you're young, uh, and I, I got fired from the Journal. Of course, my father got me back within a day. It was all who you knew back then. It was a different world. And uh, I wound up going then to the New York Post. Luckily so, because the Journal American closed up. So I went to the Post, and really nobody ever shaped in the Post because it was a, uh, they always figured the Post was going to close. Well, it didn't. It went on and on and on, and the post was, is still surviving today. So, as time went on, I I, uh, I wound up buying a, a, a luncheonette with my cousin Angelo D'Amico, who is Joey D'Amico, also a made guy. I'm sure you know the name. Yeah, Joey the Mook. Yeah, yes, right. So it, it was his father Angelo that may he rest in peace was a sweetheart of a guy, a hell of a cousin. Uh, we got along, and then he, I bought him out of the luncheonette. I failed in the luncheonette, uh, wasn't paying attention, and I went back to the post, and uh, I, 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 I got to meet uh, uh, a gentleman by Rick Mazio, and uh, um, uh, Al came into the picture. My uncle Al came into the picture uh, uh, and claimed that he helped me get certain things at Marine and Aviation, which he really was not the one who got them, uh, was my uncle Pete Tosto, but that was Al Walker. He always made you understand that he was the guy, he was the guy, he was the guy. So, and you know what, let me let me stop for a second. I, I'm not going to talk bad of anybody. It doesn't make sense. Yep. I, I'm just stating facts. Yep. I have no desire to knock anybody uh, it's not me. It ain't going to do me no good to do that anyway, Scott. No, that's, so, all, that's all we want to do is just tell a story and, and right. 
and, and you have an amazing story to tell and we're not looking to pass judgment or, or uh, cast dispersions on other people. This is just you telling your story from your lens. Okay. I just wanted you to understand that I'm not that sort of person. I'm not going to stand here and knock anybody. So let me move on. So I wound up getting the, the how I start making money. I wound up with the newsstand through Rick Mazio at the ferry terminal, the Manhattan uh, Staten Island ferry terminal. And from getting the newsstand there, I wound up with the newsstands on the Staten Island side. Of course, we're giving a kip, kickback to Rick Mazio. This is in the 1970s, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Mid 19, mid 70s, I think. And and was Do, was Rick uh, Mazio? Was it, was his real name Dominic? No, not that I know of. I always knew him as Rick Rick Mazio. Okay, I think his his legal name might have been Dominic. But so so Rick Mazio was a big shot within the newspaper union. Oh no no no! Rick Mazio was the guy at Marina Navigation. He, he had nothing to do with the newspaper business. Okay. He he was the guy who met with his demise later on. Yeah. I was confusing okay. him. So tell us who he was again, please. He he was one of the commissioners at Marine and Aviation. Okay. Explain to us who he was and what he did. What he did was there was I, I got to meet him through my cousin Frankie Cantarella, and he told, we wanted the, the newsstand downstairs. There's two levels to the ferry terminal. And I made up a story to the about the guy that had the stand. I created a lie that the guy was the... A bookmaker, and when the ferry, uh, when the uh, the authorities in the marine and age, uh, marine and aviation, which was Rick Mazio, found out about it, but it was all a lie. Uh, they they threw him out, and I wound up with the newsstand. Okay. You you you're following so yes, far? Yes, following it. Okay. Now that newsstand was strictly newspapers, not candy, cigarettes, magazine, strictly newspapers, and my cousin Frankie ran it for me. So, with that being said now, I wind up with the newsstands upstairs and in Staten Island. Altogether, it was four newsstands. Three of them, Scott, were with cigarettes, newspapers, magazines, candy, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, I started doing very well. Rick Mazio, they offered me the parking facility that housed the cars that the people who worked in marine and aviation on the Manhattan side they changed it to public parking. And he came to me, he said, Richie, why don't you take it? I said, what the hell do I know about parking? And this was his exact word. He said, what is there to know? Car pulls in, the car pulls out. Well, I took it. I went into partnerships with Al Walker, my uncle, Alan Barato, and we were doing very well. We put in 6,000 apiece, 12,000 went where it had to go. I don't know how they divided it up upstairs, you know, whoever got a piece of it. And me and my uncle were partners on this, and we were doing very well. I had the newsstands and the parking lot, so I stopped making money. And, of course, uh, wise guys look to latch on to you when you're making money. Mm -hmm. Just for people to know, it's the people that watch the movies and kind of uh, absorb all the pop culture depictions of organized crime. You see a lot of uh, guys that are able to, you know, create a name for themselves in organized crime because of uh, their muscle or their, their, their lethality. But in reality, the biggest equalizer in, in the world of the mob is being able to, you know, brass tacks, how much money you make, how big of an envelope are you giving to the boss? It's no different. It's business. That's all it is. It's business. The more flags you put out there, the more money flows in, the more money gets up to the boss. Mm -hmm. That's it's all about business. It's no different. Somewhat maybe like the government, some like like anything else. It's business. It's how much money can you bring in? So I got involved with taking care of my uncle every month. And uh, then my cousin Tony Mirror came home from prison who didn't even remember me. He was gone. I don't know, 15, 16 years. And, uh, he, me and him, I, I love the guy to death. I got to tell you, uh, Scott, I'm sorry what took place with him. Mm -hmm. I love the guy to death, but uh, we got off to a bad start. He was very jealous of me. You know, I was, he come home to me making money. I was doing very well. Uh, uh, they, went, they went down, him and my Uncle Al. Actually, let, let me back up a little bit. I was not getting no money until this. Him and Tony Mirror went down to the newsstand and took the money from my my guy working the newsstand, took it from him. And they gave it back to me the next day, and this is how 
my uncle wound up getting money every month from me. That's how he got money. Okay. He wasn't he wasn't getting it before that. So he wasn't an earner. You kind of made him an earner. Yes, he wasn't an earner. No, he was not an earner. And he he wound up. Uh, 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 you know, that's how he, he, let me put it in an exact word. They shook me down, mm-hmm. uh, on and on and on. So Tony mirror, me and Tony mirror had a fierce argument one day in the street. And, uh, my, 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 uh, uh my cousin, Joey D'Amico was there and he, he broke us up. Not that we were getting physical, but verbal. And, uh, he, 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 we just, we, we went from a good start from coming home from prison. We became arch enemies. So, uh, from there, it, it just went on and on. It was a terrible thing. Uh, he wound up, I believe my uncle wound up under Sonny Black, uh, who was part of that, uh, Joe Pistone situation. Yeah, that's so Don, yeah, Dominic uh, Sonny Black Napolitano was a a, yes, a capo yes. in the in the Bonanno crime family, and you're you're telling us that uh, your uncle Al Walker, aka Alfredo Embarado, wound up under Sonny Black, right? Right. Then I come to find out that Tony Mirror made a claim to me to sign, that he that I originally belonged to him. I, I don't know what they were doing behind the scenes. These are all the different things I heard. Sonny Black would not discuss it with me because my uncle took me to Sonny Black one day and said to Sonny, uh, tell my nephew what uh, Tony Mirror had to say. He said, Al, he said, I, I ask you not to repeat this story, and Sonny just let it die. Uh, so there, there was this rift all the time between us. Uh, I'm trying to think how it went down as we went on. Uh, uh, oh, Tony, then they, they uh, we went one day, I went with my uncle, and I might be missing something in between, uh, Scott, I don't know. But I went with my uncle one day. Uh, Joe Messina wanted to see him, and Joe ordered that uh, uh, Tony Mirror had to be killed. So uh, it, it, Joey D'Amico was involved because Joey was closest to Tony. Uh, Tony was on the lam somewhat, and Joey, Joey was the only one that really could get him. Supposedly, Caesar, who was Tony's captain could not get to him. We're talking about uh, uh, Cesare uh, Bonaventure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Caesar was his captain, couldn't get to him. At least that's what was told to my uncle by Joe Messina. So what happened was the three of us engaged to wind up going after Tony. I was the the car outside waiting for my cousin Joey D'Amico to come out after, uh, I hate to use the word, but killing Tony Mirror. Killed him in the in the garage, came out, and I was the pickup car and took him away. This was in 1982, I believe. Yes, exactly. Okay, so let, let's, uh, so, Richie. Before we go any further, let's, you know, let's peel back for a second and give a little context yeah. because yeah. not not every person that's listening to this podcast has a you know an in depth knowledge of the Bonanno crime family. So uh, just for people that don't know, all the names that that um, Richie's been mentioning over the last you know five ten minutes. Uh, Joey, uh, Joey the Mook D'Amico, uh, Al Embarado, a.k.a. Al Walker, Tony Mira, Sonny Black, Joe Massino. These were all major players in the Bonanno crime family uh, in the 70s and 80s. And as uh, Richie mentioned uh, when he said Joe Pistone, uh, most people probably don't know who Joe Pistone is when you first hear that name. But when you say Joe Pistone played the role of Donnie Brasco, a lot of people uh, will suddenly be aware of what we're talking about. And Donnie Brasco uh, was an undercover operation that was um, started by an FBI agent named Joe Pistone, went undercover uh, as Donnie Brasco was a, a, a creation of the federal government to give him a cover. Um, and he infiltrated the Bonanno crime family, which was then uh, dramatized in the film Donnie Brasco, which came out in 1997 with Al Pacino and Johnny Depp playing uh, Joe Pistone. And then... Michael Madsen, famous from uh, all of the Quentin Tarantino movies, playing Sonny Black. And although Richie and his uncle Al and his cousin Tony uh, and his other, uh, Tony Mira and then his other cousin Joey, although they were not depicted as characters in that film, they were, you know, smack dab in the eye of the storm. And when Joe Pistone was eventually revealed as, or when Donnie Brasco, rather, was eventually revealed as FBI and FBI agent Joe Pistone, there was a big fallout. And the fallout 
uh, uh, part of the fallout was Tony Mira was marked for execution um, because, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Richie, uh, the Bonanno, the brass of the Bonanno crime family blamed Tony Mira for bringing uh, Joe Pistone, who was acting as Donnie Brasco, uh, into the fold with the Bonanos and uh, his punishment for bringing an FBI agent in, uh, an undercover FBI agent into the inner circle of the banana crime, uh, crime family was to be murdered. And the way they do things in the mob, your enemies don't murder you. Uh, your, your closest friends and family murder you. So uh, Richie and his cousin uh, and his uncle were, were assigned to murder his other cousin. And that was the, the murder that he just described uh, that took place in the parking lot. Is that correct? That's correct. So... I also want to just peel back uh, for a second and just have you give, and then we'll go forward uh, with what we were just talking about. But we were talking about uh, parking structures and the newspaper industry through the, the through the post. And I think when a lot of people think of the traditional legitimate businesses that the, the organized crime gets their hooks into, they think of sanitation, they think of construction, they think of pornography or strip clubs, but people don't think of the newspaper industry or or the parking structure industry, but you guys really uh, made that a, a cornerstone of, you know, of your little Bonanno mob empire where you were for what, what, two, two, three decades were controlling the New York post and who was getting distribution routes, who was allowed to have those, those sales bays that were selling the newspaper. And, and that gave you guys a lot of power. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Can you talk about that? Like well, the fact that, you know, people wouldn't think that the newspaper industry would be vulnerable to that, but you guys had your hook into the, the union that controlled all the newspaper workers. Well, we control basically the, del- the delivery of the newspapers, the, uh, not the entire building, not, not the, uh, uh, the, the reporters or anything. We control the delivery end. Mm-hmm. If you were lending money out, you had to take care of us. If you were stealing from the the paper, you had to take care of us. If you would take it, if you were a bookmaker, in other words, we controlled it. We owned it. It was ours. You had to take care of us. Everything the illegal that went on in in the papers had to be taken, in the post had to be taken care of us. It's kind of like in Detroit where a lot of the wise guys, both kind of black and white, would have control of the auto factories. And then, any, like you're saying, anything that was going on illegal within that auto factory subculture, whether it be numbers, drugs, sports gambling, people, you know, uh, uh, selling swag, everyone, you know, it needed to be kicked up. Yes. So in that case, so like the auto factory itself, the executives that were making the cars weren't necessarily corrupt. And in, in your case, the, the, the New York Post, the editors and the publishers weren't corrupted, but all of their employees that, that had operations going on, you know, at the property, they were being corrupted and compromised. At the delivery end yeah. of it, the yeah. delivery end, yeah. that end of it was corrupt. Uh, the mob ran it. Uh, if you needed a job, Scott, you'd come and see us and we would make sure you got a job. Uh, we controlled all of it. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 and then later on, as things went on, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead. You no, it's okay. Me. No, no, this is perfect. Keep going. Uh, later on, uh, I want you to know, when Tony Mirror got killed, I was not a made guy. Right. I was not a made guy, and it was never told to the the upper echelon of the Bonanno family that I took part of it because Al Walker was holding me back. He held me back based on money because... And then as time went on, there was a little bit of a rift between us to getting, getting wider and wider. Uh, he wanted me, wanted, I was driving a, uh, what was that, Paul, the red Mercedes, an SL? An SL Mercedes, and he wanted me to give it over. He had a girlfriend for 50 years. Her name was Lucy, uh, even to the point when I was in uh, the company of friends that she was there, he, my Uncle Al, meaning he, wanted me to call her Aunt Lucy because he made everybody understand that was his wife. Okay. I know it sounds crazy to you, but this is what existed. Uh, because if you think about it, if I'm in the company of other friends with him, why wouldn't I call her her aunt? Right. Think about it, you know what I mean? Yep. So, uh, I, you know, you wound up calling her Aunt Lucy, wanted me to give my car to her. I, why would I give my car to her? He always tried shaking me down because I was doing very well in life. I wound up building... 
uh, a home that I sold for $2.5 million later on when I got in trouble. So I never gambled, Scott. I never gambled, never drank. I, I wasn't bouncing at night like, let's say, the normal wise guy. Uh, I, I didn't hang out no place. I was with my wife. So I, 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 all I ever did was invest. I put money into different, uh, mostly real estate. That's what I like doing, uh, Scott. I, I like, I didn't get involved with the stock market. I, I like, I have to feel it, smell it, touch it, step on it. You know what I mean, Scotty? Yeah, so, yeah. uh, uh, that, that, so I, I was a money maker I, until today. I, you needed tangible investments, things that you could you right. know, see as opposed to uh, just seeing a computer screen. And thank God I did that, Scott, because the end result by getting in trouble, I wound up not like a normal wise guy that lived on somebody, uh, you shaking down different places and uh, bookmaking or something. I had legitimate businesses that I wound up selling off that I could reinvest back in Arizona where I am. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it benefited me to stay legitimate in that, that aspect of it. So uh, I, I had, when I got arrested, I had 150000 in the street to one guy, a guy by the name of Joe Torrey. He was another made guy. I gave him the money. He lent it out, uh, Scott, to whoever he, I didn't want to know who he lent it to. He was responsible for the money for two points a week. Mm -hmm. I got 3000 a week. And of course, when I got arrested, God bless him, he the money was his. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was doing very good with that. Look, Scott, when, when you in that life, and especially a captain, and you're a gentleman, don't stick your finger in nobody's face, more and more people come to you for help. I got involved with, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead again. No, it's okay. I got, a, I got involved with an oil business because some people in the Gambino family were shaking this guy down. And he was delivering oil to one of my uh, uh, properties, and he finally came to me for help. And I, 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 they shook him down for a lot of money, but I got, I got him away from them, and then invested in his business. I put seventy-five thousand into his business, and I got him oil back again through my Gumba Joe Butch, uh, through Bayside Fuel that was uh, Joe Butch sort of controlled. He's gone now. He's dead, Joe Butch. Joe, Joe Butch, uh, you're talking about Joe Carrillo uh, from the Gambinos? Joe Carrillo, yeah. Yeah, okay. A, gen a gentleman and a half, really a gentleman and a half. And he helped get him back uh, uh, to me, get him back having fuel, oil without having to pay, you know, put it on consignment. I got involved, too, with uh, uh, somebody that uh, when I was building my house uh, later on, I don't know if a year or two years later, whatever it was, after I finished my house, came to me for help. He originally was painting my house. He said he was being uh, shooken down by some people in the Gambino family. I strained that out for him. I put up $10,000. They said he owed 80000 They settled for ten. And he asked me, this fella, uh, what was his name, John? Yeah, yeah John. Uh, he asked me, how, how am I going to pay it back, which I got no money. I said, I don't want it back. He drove an ice cream truck called Lickety Split. I said, anything that comes along legitimate, let me know. I wound up owning, Scott, five ice cream trucks. <laughs> and and, and we, we fixed them. We painted them. We knew, we knew them. I had them in the street. I think it was from Labor Day uh, until um, uh, not Labor Day, Memorial Day to Labor Day. That's the time they were out in the street, strictly Staten Island. And when I cooperated with the governor, I got beat out of that too, uh, because I was not on paper. It was all under his name, and I got robbed out of, of that too by this guy, John. But you were very industrious, very entrepreneurial, and, and looking, obviously, yes. to, to uh, diversify and, and not just make your money with tr the traditional rackets, which, like you said, that's, that's kind of, in a lot of ways, that's short money. That's money that can go away in a second, as opposed to yes. long money that's working for you for, for, you know, for decades. Yes. I couldn't have said it any better. What, I, I, you know, I had, I had a... Uh, um, a garbage guy that he owned a, a truck. You know we control the garbage industry, mm -hmm. right? In New York, mm -hmm. uh, he would give me twenty thousand a year, ten thousand at Christmas, ten thousand in July. Uh, he was under my 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 wing, so to speak. Uh, the 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 New York uh, the San Gennaro feast. Uh, we were getting thirty thousand a year from that uh, through the uh, through Perry Crisciatelli. Uh, I wound up making him a made guy too. I, I'll get into that story, but. Uh, he, he owned a couple of restaurants on Mulberry Street, and he got involved uh, with uh, with being some of the uh, the leaders in the uh, the committee that ran the feast. 
So he was able to get to uh, the people that put the lights up and the garbage. So none of them could have had those contracts without doing the right thing, meaning the $30,000. So, Richie, I want to I, I want to get your um, I know, uh, you know, just bear with me and the audience bear with us. We're kind of going all over the place. But Richie has got such, uh, you know, there's such a palette to paint from here and telling a story. It's so rich and textured. I want to make sure we we get as much uh, insight from from Richie as possible. So, Richie, let's just go backwards for a second to go forwards again. Um, I, I want to get your take on some of the uh, the political machinations that were going on in your crime family, both before you got your button, uh, before you were initiated, and then after. So in the 1970s, when you were on the come up, uh, y- you you had a, a factional dispute between Carmine Galante uh, and uh, Rusty Rustelli. You mean that's what was going on in the family? Yes, that was going on in the family. Yes. So, what was your, uh, what, what were you being told? I guess as a guy at that time, you were in your thirties or um, about to hit your thirties, and you had these kind of two heavyweights that were battling for control of the family, and then one of them, in Carmine Galante, starts importing all of these Sicilians. And you mentioned one uh, a, a while uh, a while back in this interview, uh, uh, Cesare uh, Bonaventri starts importing all these these Sicilians to kind of be his own family within a family, which is kind of yeah. alienating the, the rank and file even more. And it, and everything was this giant powder keg until it finally exploded in the summer of 1979 when uh, Carmine Galante was murdered in a very public execution. Um, and even his, his Sicilian inner circle had turned on him and, and Bonaventure, who had been his kind of right hand, uh, had been involved in the assassination, and then Bonaventure becomes uh, a capo at a very young age. So can you just kind of talk about what your observations were at the time of what was going on? I mean, did it just seem like it was surreal? I wasn't really 100% in the know. I, I just went along with, uh, you know, Joe Messina, I, I didn't know him like I knew him at the end. I knew him from a distance, but the man was always a gentleman with me, and uh, his side was to... Uh, he was there for Rusty, uh, so I, I'd lean towards whatever Joe did was okay. You know, the way I'll go along with what Joe says. You know what I mean? I, I didn't know Carmine Galanti. I did not know Rusty Rustelli. I, I, uh, I, I, I just went along with. Uh, this is where where the trend of you can't just come in and take over a family. And Joe was running things for 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 Rusty, and I, I just went. I just went with the flow. Nobody. Uh, my uncle did not tell, tell me that this is the way we got to go. I just went along with it. And matter of fact, the, uh, the, the day that those three captains were killed, the night, whatever it was, the next day or the day after that, there was a meeting in, um, uh, uh, in uh, I can't even think of the, uh, the name of the area, but right over the Delancey Street Bridge and in an apartment that Joe was there and they, they, had a, they were straightening out a lot of differences some of the guys were having in the family, and I wasn't allowed to go into the kitchen where the discussions were. So I was sitting outside in the living room. Why I was there, Scott, I have no idea. I think my uncle took me with me, thinking that if their intentions were to kill him, that they wouldn't do it while I was there. Mm -hmm. And to prove that, many years later, now I get close to Joe Messina, and I told Joe of it. He said, Richie, we would have never heard you. At least that's what he told me. So here I am sitting in the next room with a, a fellow named Booby, who wound up being a, a made guy under Sonny, uh, Sonny Black. I don't know if you knew Booby. Yeah, John, John Sarasani uh, went by the nickname okay. uh, Booby. And in the movie um, Donnie Brasco, they changed his name, but he was the, the James Russo character. Go ahead. Okay. So you know pretty much, better than me probably. <laughs> but anyway, there I am sitting there listening. You could have heard their voices, and they asked, uh, my uncle Al, if he ever, I think he called, um, what the hell was his name? Uh, Dador. Did you know the name Sal- Salvador Dador? He was one of the boys from the other side. Toto Catalano? Uh, yes, I think that was his yeah. name. And and my uncle called him a greaseball or something, uh, and it got back to his ears. So uh, my uncle, of course, denied it, and they sort of, I guess, shook hands. I mean, I wasn't there visually, but I could hear and they put whatever it was. Another way, what Joe was trying to do now is let the family go forward. The mm-hmm. three captains were gone. Nobody was looking to take over the family. 
uh, and Carmine Galenti was gone, and, and so let's let the Bonanno family go forward. So I just want to, again, I want to, I want to clarify for, for people that might not know all the specifics here. So Galante is murdered in 1979, and then the three capos murder that Richie is, is referencing here was actually depicted in the movie Donnie Brasco, and that was a further factional dispute that erupted after the first factional dispute was yeah. resolved. So Carmine Galante is murdered, and Rusty Rustelli takes over the family, uh, you know, uh, takes full control of the family. Joe Messino, who uh, Richie keeps on referencing, was Rusty Rustelli's protege and, and kind of his underboss. Joe Messino would eventually, and we're going to talk about him in the second half of this interview quite a bit, he would grow to be the biggest godfather in all of america the biggest godfather in new york um throughout the 90s rebuilt the the bonanno crime family from really uh, the ashes uh they were in tatters and and rebuilt them into a a monstrosity in a matter of about 15 years and richie was a, was a big part of that but uh there were th- uh three three captains um that were aiming to get rid of Ristelli's uh uh, captains. So, so uh, Sonny Black, who we mentioned before, was being opposed by a guy named Sonny Red. Um, and then Sonny Red's two best friends were two other capos, uh, Phil Lucky Giacconi and uh, Dominic Big Trini uh, Trinquera. Uh, and they were lured to what was thought to be a sit down to resolve uh, the second factional dispute. And in fact, it was an execution. All three capos. Um, I should say all three renegade capos were murdered. This was in 1981. And then, um, as, as Richie said, Joe Messino and, and Phil Rusty Ristelli go about um, reconstructing the family uh, and, and trying to build it from a kind of a healthier, less contentious standpoint. And, and things would be uh, pretty healthy and, and thriving uh, for the next 10 to 15 years. And then eventually some more um, drama started to erupt within Joe Messino and his brother-in-law and his wife that we'll talk about in a second. But um, so Richie, t- t- talk about how you got made. You said that your uncle didn't want to give you credit for the, the Tony Mira hit in 82, which probably should have got you, should have got you your button then, but uh, your, mm-hmm. your uncle was, was, was blocking you. Um, and what, what led you to eventually get in your button? Well, I, I didn't know he was blocking me. I come to find out later on uh, that, that Joe Messina never knew I was involved with the Tony Mera uh, uh, killing. So when he became aware of it, I believe it was my cousin Joey uh, that let him know. I, you know what? There's so many stories, Scott. You might think I'm crazy, but I don't remember them as well as you think I should. That's okay. So somebody let Joe Messina know that I was involved, and after he knew I was involved, uh, I, I wound up, my name went in, and I, I got straightened out. And my uncle didn't know I, I knew all this f- uh, from the side. He made it look like he put my name in, and that's how I got made. So, uh, are, you, are you comfortable talking about the induction ceremony that you went through? Y- yeah, I, I got no problem. So do uh, you know when it was and who was there and what were the... Kind of well, the, uh, was, call, color it up for us. When I got made, it was a Spiro. He was running things, I think, at the time because Joe Messino was not around. It, you see, now a, a little bit is starting to come to my life. I think Sa. Originally, I was supposed to get made before Joey. Uh, before Joe went to jail, and my uncle put the stop on it. Something he did that I didn't get straightened out. Joe went to jail, and then it was Sal, his brother-in-law, took took the message back to him, I understand, while he was in jail, that Richie was involved with the Tony Mirror killing. And word come down for me to get straightened out, and there was Joe Messina, uh, uh, um, what the hell was I, the Spiro there? Anthony Spiro was Joe Messino's acting boss and consigliere. Frank Coper was the one, my son just reminded me, I, I wound up moving in the same community off the water down there, and Frankie Copa was there, and I got very friendly with Frank Copa. You know that name yeah, so too, Frank, right? Yeah, Frank Copa was a, a confidant of Joe Messino, um, right. eventually became a capo. He was really the definition of an earner. He wasn't a tough guy at all, right? No, no. He never did nothing in the term. Uh, the guy never killed a cockroach. Right. So, uh, I, I, but he rose. So, but he rose high because he he was making so much money for Joe Messina. Right. Yeah, he was a, a little bit of a schemer, Frankie. But you know what? 
I, I miss him too. He wasn't a bad guy. And uh, I wound up lending him money to finish building his home. I think I left him, what did I lend him, 25000 Paul, or fifty? a uh, year. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so now he took me sort of, how come your uncle never made you? Uh, without my uncle knowing anything, when he went and visited Sal, he would take me to see Sal, and Sal got to know me, uh, and Sal carried the message back to, to, to uh, his brother-in-law in prison, and, and I wound up getting straightened out. Uh, and uh, uh, who was there the day I got straightened out was, uh, like I say, Spiro, Frankie Lino, because Frankie Lino represented Bobby Lino. So he was there, and my uncle. It was very. It wasn't like a full blown ceremony, Scott. It was uh, just my you. My son. It was just you. It was just me and Bobby Lino. That's okay. all that got made. When my to tell you the difference, when my son got made, it was like a big deal. You know, we had uh, we had food, we had champagne. Uh, Joe Messina was there. There was the holding of hands. Uh, the whole thing. It was, uh, you know, if you believe in the life, to me. It, it was one of the, the most best times of my life. And it wasn't my idea for my son to get made. It was Sal. When when I went to prison in 90... You see, I'm jumping around. It's okay. But well, when, I went, when I went to prison in 94 for controlling the newspaper business, mm -hmm. okay, I put my son with Sal Vitale. Sal took a liking to him. My son loved him. They got along. When I come home, Sal said... Why don't you put your son's name in? And that's how my son got straightened out. But it was a whole different glorified ceremony. And Salva, good-looking Sal Vital was Joe Massino's brother-in-law. That's him. He was married to Sal's sister, right? Uh, Joe Massino was married to Sal's sister, correct. Okay, so uh, Sal Vital became his underboss. Um, and this is where some of the drama starts. Uh, Sal, so uh, I... I Go ahead, Scott. No, I'm no, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, you're the expert, so you tell us. So Joe Massino and, and Sal Vitale were kind of a, they were a team. I mean, they were brother-in-laws, boss, underboss. And then as the 90s begin to progress, um, there there begins to be a, a frame of that relationship where uh, Massino, for the sake of – you tell me if I'm, if I'm uh, narrating this correctly. Mas Massino, for the sake of further insulating – um, himself and and his and his crime family, he decentralizes and makes sure that all or makes certain that all the crews are kind of acting separately. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Um, so if you know if one guy and one crew gets in trouble, he can't take down the whole family. But by doing this, he 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 kind of cuts his underboss's legs from out from underneath him and and takes the power of controlling all the capos away from Sal Vitale, which kind of makes Sal Vitale a figurehead. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I, you know, I, I really don't, I don't know what happened between them. All I know, I, I, let me go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. when, when Joe came home and he was on parole, and then he got off of parole, I hadn't seen Joe in, in 10 years, let's say, okay? Because right. he went away and he did, I, I think at that time it was only... 65%, I think he did six and a half years, and then the rest he was on parole. Well, one day I was talking to Sal on the phone. Sal, on his side, hands the phone to his brother-in-law, Joe Messina. Joe gets on the phone. I recognize his voice immediately. He said, I'll see you for dinner Friday night. Never says where, and I meet him in a place called Gargiulio's. It's in, in Coney Island. And the reason why I didn't, he didn't have to mention the name because we both used to eat there at one time. Are you familiar with this place called God Julio's? No, but I, I read about that that's where you met him when you both got out of prison. Okay. So now I go there that night. This is where I'm coming into play with his brother-in-law. I go there that night. He introduces me to his wife. I introduce my wife. And he pulls me off the table for maybe an hour or more. And he starts questioning me about a lot of different things. His brother-in-law, his brother-in-law. So... I did nothing but brag about his brother-in-law, rightfully so. His brother-in-law was very cautious. His brother-in-law this, is that. Well, he said to me, I taught him everything he knows. Now I see where it's going. The drift is going to, there's something not right here. I don't know if Joe felt too many guys got to like Sal 
and he felt he was a threat down the line. I really don't know, Scott, what took place between them. Do you remember them being close, though, at any time? Do you ever remember them being, like, super close, and then all of a sudden they weren't? Or you just never knew them when they were super close? You only knew them when they started to... No, all, all I know is he straightened out his brother law so they must have been close, and then, then he made him a captain. He didn't make him underboss right away. I think they had something about Louis Ha Ha yeah. uh, in, in the position of running things, and then I think Spiro went to him and spoke. From what I hear, I don't know this from them. From what I hear, Spiro stepped in and he spoke for Sal. This is your brother-in-law, and he made him on the boss. Let's regress for a second and tell the audience. I'm going to let you tell uh, why did the Anastasio brothers, uh, Louis and Bobby, they went by the nicknames Louis Ha Ha and Bobby Ha Ha. <laughs> Tell people why they got that nickname. I, I don't know, to be honest. Oh, you don't know? Oh, I thought you no. know. The reason they got that nickname was because Louis, I guess at a, a point uh, in the 70s, was, was asked to do a hit, and he started laughing. So they called him. No, I, he, like, he laughed I, at the idea of doing a hit, so they, they called him Haha. Ha. <laughs> I did not know that. And Louis was a big earner, from what I understand. Yeah, that's Louis what I read. Ha -ha was a big one. Yeah, and uh, anyway, I don't know what took place between the, you know, uh, at home. I know Sal wasn't getting along with his wife, and, and he was living in the basement, and Joe said, what kind of man are you? Well, leave the house. You leave her. You know what I mean? But don't be living in the basement. I don't really know, Scott. I'd be lying to you if I made up a story. So I don't know, but it, 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 he put me, I was giving Sal 1500 a month, uh, I, I, I forget why I was giving him fifteen hundred money, and then Joe spoke to me and said, "Don't give my brother-in-law the money no more. Give it all to me." So I went to Sal, and we were at a we were at a wake, somebody's wake, and there was Big Louie there. Frankie Copa was my uh, my guy, I think at the time. I, I don't remember exactly. And he said, uh, uh, "I told him uh, he." I never told him. I couldn't tell him that Joe told me. I said, it ain't there no more, Sal. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if Joe was testing me, my loyalty to him, but I got a little uppity with Sal, and Frankie pulled me to the side, and he says, you can't talk to Sal. You know, the guy is an underboy. I said, well, what do you want me to do? I, I didn't tell nobody that Joe told me not to give him the money no more. I said, what do you want me to do, Frank? The money ain't there. Well, how else do I tell him? He didn't want to accept it, Sal, that way. Richie, when did you become, when did you get up to uh, Capo Regime? Okay, so let me tell you when I, I started from the beginning. When I got made, I had a captain that was Frankie the Fireman, a real nice gentleman. You know of his name? Frank Porco? Uh, yeah, I think that was his name. Frankie yeah. Porco? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no sooner I got made, Sal took me, not took me away, how do I explain? You have to have to have a captain because if you have a problem, you have to have someone to represent you. That would be your captain. Mm -hmm. You can't have the underboss or the boss represent you. That's why there's captains. Right. So I always had him as a captain, but Sal took me away and I became Sal's, how would I say, a chauffeur, go-to guy. You know what I mean? If we were at a wedding or a wake, you couldn't get to Sal unless you went through me. Mm-hmm. You follow? So yep. I, I got very close to Sal. I pick him up eight, nine o'clock at night in Long Island, take him to locations in New York. I don't know where he went. I would be parked there. He'd go in the building. I don't know if he was in the building, came out the other side. But anyway, you know, nobody have ever knew. I never repeated it to nobody. So I guess my confidence with him kept building and building. And then when, uh, when like I say, with Joe come home and I met with him in God Julio's, our relationship went on and on, and I got very close to Joe. I, and I got to tell you the truth, Scott, I, a man to man, as a man, I don't misunderstand. I fell in love with Joe. He, mm -hmm. he was a gentleman and a half. He didn't stick his finger in nobody's face. He didn't put his hands in nobody's pockets. Uh, we, we had the same view where we wanted the family to grow. And he finally made me a captain. And I think I had 12 guys under me, including my cousin Joey D'Amico. And... Uh, I, I don't remember exactly from when I got made captain to when I got, actually got made. I don't know the time period. Was there uh, any resentment with your cousin Joey the Joey Demook? Because um, he got he got made before you, but then you passed him by pretty quickly once you got your button, became a capo, and then eventually part of the administration. I don't know, Scott. I don't know. I would imagine yes, there might have been some. But when I made Joe then my acting captain, okay. he really hadn't. He had no desire. 
he liked the title, but he didn't want, don't ever introduce me, Richie, as your acting captain. He didn't want that kind. All Joey was interested in, he was a ladies' man. He loved staying out. He liked uh, drugs, from what I come to find out. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I had to take him down eventually, Scott. I took him down as my acting captain. So I guess there was some resentment. Who became your acting captain after Joey? I don't think I, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I made anybody my acting captain. I went without it. So talk, talk about uh, Joe Massino, getting close to him. What were his best attributes as a boss? Why was he able to take a family that was, you know, was kicked out of the commission in the 80s because of the Donnie Brasco thing and was really on the outs with all the other families? And in a matter of, you know, 10 years, he takes the family from, you know, from the bottom all the way to the top. I don't know. Maybe you did. I don't, I don't expect an answer. If you spoke to Joe, the man knew how to talk. He was a gentleman. He wasn't, like I say, he didn't stick his finger in nobody's face. And, and the way things were going back then, if I remember right, most of the bosses were in jail, I think, uh, at the time. So yep. I think it was him and Chin, maybe, the only real street guys, uh, bosses that were in the street. So he slowly rose to power. And like I say, he brought it all back together with his... I mean, he was in the life since he's a kid. You know what I mean? So uh, he was very well-liked by everybody. Very well-liked, uh, uh, Scott. And he was able to put it together. Like I say, even with legitimate business, he was a good legitimate businessman. He ran the family right. He was a fair guy. You couldn't go to him and say, you know, uh, Tony... Uh, what's his name? PG, Tony Graziano, yeah. is using drugs. Uh Let's kill him. You couldn't do that. He would do his own. Was that legitimate? What uh, Richie just referenced was uh, the murder, I believe, in 1998 of uh, Gerlando uh, Shaka. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Or Shachia? Uh, they called him George from Canada. He was the uh, liaison between the Bananos and their crew up in uh, Montreal. And he, he was, a, a, I believe he was a captain, and then he started bad-mouthing Joe Massino's consigliere, Anthony Graziano, who they all call TG, and claim right. and claim to Joe, you know, every time I'm with uh, TG, the guy's uh, high on cocaine. Now, was that that's the that's the story or the narrative that's been that's been rolled out there? You think that's true? Yes, how I got it. Not that he was always high. Now he might have said that. I don't think Joe would want to repeat that. What what came to my ears from Joe is he said. If I were boss, TG could never be my captain. Okay. So, I, you know, think about it. If you, You're not going to want to repeat something like that, that he said he's always high. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Joe put it in his own words. If I were boss, this is what George claimed. So he felt George was questioning him about his ability to pick a captain. He was being, subvers he was being subversive. Right. And he made, he made up, a, he said, listen, here's what we're going to put out there. We're going to say that it was a drug deal that went bad with George, and they wound up killing him. And uh, uh, he brought, he, like, he was, you see, I was one of the guys that knew the truth. Uh, Vinny, Vinny Gorgeous, when Vinny came in, he said, you want me to take care of this, Joe? I'll find out. He said, no, you're not listening to what I'm saying. He said, I'm telling you, keep your ears open, not to go ask questions, because Joe really knew what the story was. It came from him. Mm -hmm. But that's the rumor he spread. And you know what, Scott? It works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it did. So when did you uh, eventually get uh, bumped up to, to Joe Massino's underboss? All I know, he never said you're underboss. All he had was five captains. I, from what I understand, he was grooming me. Okay. He, he never he never really came to me and said, now you're my underboss. He was, I, I, then later on, I heard he was grooming me. He had five captains reporting to me. And I got to tell you, Scott, it is not something I wanted. It is not a job I wanted. My son who very smart young fella he came to me he said dad this is going to blow up in our face and sure enough it did if i don't get close to joe messina and i'm not resenting it or regretting i'm only saying mm -hmm. if he don't bring me under his wing i could have flew under the radar forever scott it was being close to him it goes along with the with the package you know i was under his shadow and i become known and, and what happens is the fbi starts looking at you to get to him and I'll tell you what the FBI told me later on. They said, we did a psychological profile of you. You're a family man, Rich. 
And sure enough, they arrested everybody in my family. Mm -hmm. put, more, put more and more pressure. They arrested my wife. They arrested my son. They were going to arrest my daughter. All bullshit cases. Not my son's case. My son's case, he got charged with uh, 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 kidnapping, which I never knew about. And when I cooperated with the government, I, may, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I, we don't do things like that. Uh, not, what, what was it, Paul? What was your... Home invasion. I said we don't we don't do things like that. We don't we don't want to. God forbid, there's a a, a mother, a, a wife in the house. God forbid, you know we don't we don't. Well, Richie, that actually did happen with uh you know uh what would be considered the JV mob of the uh, of the Bananos at that time was a, a group called the Bath Avenue Boys, and yes. there was a no home no no no. No, that wasn't. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Scott. No, I said go there ahead. was a, there was a home invasion where an innocent woman ended up getting killed, and that's yes, yes, yes. You, you see what I'm trying to say, yeah. Scott? That's, yeah. that's bad business. Yes, that's not what we're about. If anything, I remember growing up being a Mulberry Street or wherever. You couldn't even curse in front of a woman. Go help her with her packages. Could you imagine invading? their house with your mother being there or your sister or something. Yep. That's not something we advocated to. So what, 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 looking back on it and kind of playing Monday morning quarterback, we're reaching the, you know, the new millennium and it's becoming the, the two thousands. And it was kind of the beginning of the end, those first couple years of the two thousands, what made everything fall apart for the, for the, Mas for the Messina regime. And then within the Messina regime, the, the, uh, the Cantarella uh, group. Well, I, I, you know, I, I started all of a sudden, I was under investigation. The FBI started following me. The FBI uh, came to my house uh, one day. They, they, I, I, listen, my house got raided twice. Joe Messini's house did not get raided. John Gotti's house did not get raided. I kept the money for the family in my house. I had up to $500,000 in my house. But the first time they came in, they were never able to find it. Do you want me to tell you where it was? Yeah. I, I had this house built on the ocean, and in my basement, they made what they call a French drain because I was on the ocean. You know what that is? Uh, I kind of understand. Well, well it, go ahead. It, it's, a, it's a drain built that, God forbid, water starts coming up from the ocean. There's a drain before it floods your house, the basement. It'll go into this drain, and then there was a room, the motor room. Well, in that room... Up at the rafters of it, I pulled out all the um, the the uh, Paulie. What do you call that stuff inside the the the, the, the stuff that they put in the ceiling? Like insulation. I pulled out the insulation, Scott, and I put a bag in there with a string, and I pushed it all the way back with like a broomstick, and I put the insulation back in. So they were never able to find the money. <laughs> now it, it happens again, but now I don't have it in my house no more, the bag. My mother, God bless her, she rests in peace, but I got to be truthful with you, never asked me a question. I put it in my mom's house. You know, the old-time Italian woman, that's where they came from. They never, She never asked me a question. I was her son. I was able to hide it in her house with nobody knowing about it. They raided my house again, but the second time they had cameras. So they went from the attic down and, you know, all through the walls and everything. They never found nothing. Somebody had to give it up that I was holding the money for the family. So, uh, you, you know, I was <laughs> – I'm going to make a joke out of this, Scott. You know I'm, I'm the president of the Italian-American Club, right? Yeah. Okay, you know I was the treasurer first. Yeah. Well, I was treasurer for the Bonanno family too, right. so I guess I got <laughs> – You got experience. Yes. You're but anyway, a, seasoned, a seasoned vet in the, in the, in the financials. Yeah, I, I, even until today, my son, my, my grandson, Richard, and I got to compliment him, too. He, he's, he's, thank God we got him. You know, I don't know how my son planned it. He did a good job making him. <laughs> but, uh, no, really, I'm not kidding with you. I'm putting it in a crude way, but uh, thank God we got him. He, he's, he's, he's very good at what he does. He's, he's today, computer. You know, he's all into that stuff, which I don't even know how to turn it on. I know you don't want to hear this part. No, it's of it, okay. No, I love I, I love this part. Yeah, people are are multi dimensional. And I was talking about this with a, a pretty decorated FBI agent, a retired FBI agent, the other day, and I said, you know, there, people are complex individuals. Good guys aren't all good, and bad guys aren't all bad. Sometimes you can have a, well, a good guy that's actually a bad guy, and a bad guy that's actually a good guy. I mean, it's not black and white. Well, 
I say that all the time, Scott. I say there's good and bad in every walk of life. Yep. Every walk. There's some agents, I, I, I mean, they're the dirty bastards in plain English. There were other FBI agents that did their job, but they were gentlemen. They, they had good bedside manners. Some of the other ones, Scott, I, I wish I could spit in their face today. <laughs> so when did the, uh, talk about the kind of the, the dominoes falling. Frank Coppa was the first one to flip, is that correct? Joe Massino's uh, confidant, a uh, guy that we just said before, wasn't a real tough guy but made a lot of money. TG? Uh, oh, Frank Coppa, yeah, no. Frank Coppa, from what I understand, yes, he was one of the first ones to flip, and I believe Joey D'Amico, because when I got questioned, there was only me and Joey D'Amico that did, like with Tony Mirror, even though Al Walker was involved, but Al was gone. So when Tony, when they knew, asked me questions, it could, I mean, you could figure it out yourself, Scott. You're asking me right now, as far as I'm concerned, there's only me and you on the phone. Yeah. How could anybody else know what we're talking about? Right. Okay. So me and Joey D'Amico did this, this, and this. How do they know about Joey D'Amico? <laughs> How do they? Uh, it's coming from Joey D'Amico. <laughs> right. So I mean, you didn't have to be a scholar to figure it out. Uh, so uh, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I spoke to my, my son privately in prison, which was a very dangerous conversation. And I said, Paul, I think the best thing is we cooperate. He was facing a lot of years. His children, I think his daughter was only two years old. Uh, I mean, what kind of a father would I, now don't misunderstand, I'm not using him as an excuse why I cooperated. I cooperated because I wanted to cooperate. I did not want to spend the rest of my life in jail. I had nothing to do with my son, but I, I, oh, he benefited because I would not want to take him away from his children at that age. What kind of a father would I be? That's how. No, I, I, I completely, uh, you know, can co-sign that, that type of thinking. I'm, I'm interested, though, in addition to that, it'd be interesting to ask Joe Messino this question. I'm, I'm hoping I can eventually ask him or we can eventually ask him. So in some ways it was so brilliant in, in the ways that, Joe Messina was, was able to rebuild a, a crime family um, in the way that he did and turn it into the uh, powerful um, kind of uh, omnipresent organization within New York uh, in the late 90s after, uh, you know, the mid 80s, the family was on was on the ropes. But he rebuilt it on the shoulders of guys like yourself and Frank Coppa, who were very intelligent uh, mafia guys, they you guys weren't knuckle draggers, but the downside to that, I believe, is when really smart people, you know, get their uh, are, are pinned against the wall, and, and they have to be pragmatic. You know, the result's going to be that they're going to save themselves. They're going to do the smart thing. So you're actually kind of by building your crime family around brains instead of brawn. Uh, in some ways, you're opening yourself up to, to a better chance of cooperation as opposed to the, the, the less intelligent knuckle-dragger types that would be quicker to stick to the, well, I made an oath, so I'll just go to prison for the rest of my life. Okay, well, with that being said, and I agree with you to an extent, but what about Joe cooperating? Was he a knuckle-dragger or was he no, the Joe, intelligent one? No, he was smart. That's why he became the first real New York right. Don to ever fly. Right. Yeah. Right. Listen, you have no idea, Scott, or you do have an idea how many people are cooperating from the street right now. Oh, I do. As long as— Believe okay. me, I, believe me. in my 15 years of doing this, if I've uh, of, of studying this and reporting on it, if I've learned anything— I've learned that the notion of people keeping their mouth shut is a fallacy. Everybody talks. Everybody. Oh, you have. Even in the Italian American club. <laughs> no. Uh, so, guys that you would never think talk, they do talk. They might never be outed as as informants. They never. They might never take the witness stand. But believe me, they're having conversations behind the scenes. And, you know, there's a bunch of guys in the Midwest, guys that were were and are bosses that I'm convinced. Are confidential informants because there's no way yes. they're able to avoid the the the, uh, the avalanches that they've been able to avoid in their in their lifetimes if they didn't have some type of deal going on with the government. Listen, Scott, I'm not going to mention names, and when I tell you the story, it's going to be obvious why I would never mention names. Yeah. But there were people, two people that called me when I got home, and they wanted to hook up because they were in the street, but they wound up cooperating with the street so they could get a paycheck from the government. Mm-hmm. 
So I, I had I had my own family cooperate against me. I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, my own personal family. Okay, tell me or tell us. Only because you said there's no secrets or nothing. I then I'm on trial. I'm on trial, and what comes up in in Vinnie Gorgeous's trial is the New York Post, and they said something pertaining to my nephew Joey Padovano, who was my sister's oldest son who worked in the Post. Now I'm coming to realize that they're cooperating against me, mm -hmm. my own personal family. Then I come to realize the purpose of it was my mother's house, my share of it was taken away from me. They cooperated against me. She quit, she, she quit deeded the house to herself, my sister, because it belonged to her and my mother. She put my mother in a home, and they were cooperating against me so I could never come back to Staten Island. They, so when, my, when I found out, my, I couldn't call my mother no more. Uh, and and this breaks my heart. You have no idea how close we were. I couldn't call my mother no more. All of a sudden, she wasn't answering the phone, Scott. Mm -hmm. I come to find out she was put in a home. I called the home. The home says, we don't have you listed as her son. She only has a daughter. So I made a phone call or two. Within about 20 minutes, I was able to talk to my mother. My mother's first words out of her mouth, Scott, were, you them dirty bastards. And I said, what are you talking about, Ma? Now, you had to understand the, 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 the heritage there of these old Italian women. She would not say nothing bad about her daughter. Mm -hmm. she, when she said those dirty bastards, they tricked her in putting her into a home. She's talking about, well, the, she she's was, talking about the FBI? No, 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 no. My sister put her in a home. Oh, she's talking. Okay, okay, I get it. She's talking about her, her my, own family. Okay. Yeah, my sister put her in a home. She said those dirty bastards. No, the FBI did not put her in a home. And the benefit was... They quick deeded the house themselves. They took it away from me, uh, my share, which is okay. All my sister had to do was talk to me. We never had a bad word between us. But again, Scott, when it comes to money, don't trust nobody. Yeah. So, and they, they took the home, and then I come to find out they spread rumors about us. It was getting back to me. You know, it's, it's a who house, Staten Island. You have no idea who knows who knows who knows who. And it got back to me that they... Uh, I cooperated against them. I said, what would I cooperate on? What did they do wrong? I don't even know. What did they do wrong that I would cooperate? Yeah. And then the, well, another one of her sons was talking about my son. Well, he wanted to be a big shot. Uh, let him go do the time 11 years because that's what my son was supposedly facing. Meanwhile, he got in trouble and he wound up cooperating with them. He thinks I don't know about it. All because he was... He was a, a book. In other words, they put pressure on him because he was taking bets. He was a, a bookmaker. They were squeezing him. Yes. And, he, you know, he couldn't do uh, 11 minutes talking about my son doing 11 <laughs> years. <laughs> right. So, but that's all right. They all turned their back. I mean, God bless them. I, I, I don't wish them good, but I don't wish them bad, Scott. But uh, uh, they did a terrible, terrible. Oh, and then when my mother died, what they did was left a message. The home left a message on my phone. It was six years. It was Mother's Day Eve, Saturday night. I come home, and on the phone is a message that my mom passed away. The next morning, I called up the home. Edgar's was the name of the home in Staten Island. They said, we're very sorry for your loss. <clears throat> I said, well, where is my mom's body? Figuring, where is she going? They said, we don't know. I said, how could you, how could you not know where my mother's body went? They were told not to tell me, so I couldn't go to the funeral. You know, I couldn't show up. So, wow. You know, it, 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 look. Scott, there were certain things, I don't know how you are in your family, where you could sit across the table and say, you know what, I didn't see you that way, let's forget about it. But there was no way I could forget about this. No way. I know, I understand, but just, to, just to, I don't know if this makes you feel any better, but, you know, everybody's family is just as crazy as everyone, others, uh, everyone else's family. Nobody, nobody can sit there and judge anyone else. I mean, if, no. if you deep dived into anybody's family life, you'd find craziness and drama and, and yeah. people doing wrong to the other. And you think that just, you know, bloodlines would, would uh, eliminate that. But in fact, some, sometimes it accentuates it. And I never had a I never had a bad word with my sister. I did have a fist fight with my brother in law. I gave him a black eye. <laughs> I, you know, maybe I got lucky, Scott. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Let's just do the last five minutes of like kind of rapid fire. Were you surprised when you found out that uh, Sal Vitali and Joe Massino had decided to cooperate? 
I, Sal I wasn't surprised by. Joe I was surprised by. Because Sal, Joe wanted to kill Sal. Right. So I was not surprised that Sal, after the FBI must have convinced him, and he believed that your brother-in-law is trying to kill you, I don't know this to be a fact. I mean, the FBI ain't coming and tell me, but it must have been after he heard what Joe was trying to do, because Joe spoke to me. Uh, he called me to the side one night in the restaurant. He said, I want to kill my brother-in-law. This, this, and this. He said, I believe he's cooperating. So as my boss and how I felt him, I said, well, I'm there if you need my help. He said, fine, but I want to pull the trigger. <laughs> I know this is crazy conversation to you, Scott, but yeah. it, it existed. But, but, but Sal, just so for people to know, Sal Vitale was not cooperating at that point. Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. I don't, I don't believe. Know. I don't believe he was. I believe that he had started cooperating after the FBI came and told him that, that they were— Oh, yes, yes. That yes, Joel yes, Messina yes, was yes. going to kill him. That's true. That's true. I don't believe Sal was cooperating at the point when yeah. Joe approached me that he right. was cooperating, but he did cooperate afterwards. And I tell you why I know for a fact. When you cooperate, they put you in segregation. Yep. So later on, many years later, I learned my son looked, you, you, you know, there's a little square uh, glass looking out your cell door. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So looking out my son's cell door, who's across on the other side looking out the cell window is Sal Vitale. <laughs> well, they both backed up in surprise. So we knew right away Sal was cooperating. But you're right. He was not cooperating back then. He was cooperating after they convinced him and he believed that Joe wanted to kill him. Yes, you're right. And the only reason that the feds would even play ball with Joe Messino is because they were desperate to take down Vinnie Gorgeous, who you mentioned before. Yeah. Vinny Basciano, yeah. who had become yeah. acting boss or kind of declared himself acting boss, was going around killing people and then talking about killing judges and prosecutors. Yes. Uh, yes. What yes. Was, uh, so just real quick, what was your take on, on Vinnie Basciano? Did you have a lot of interaction with him? No, I, and I didn't. And I, I didn't dislike him. I like Vinny, but Vinny saw, solved problems like John Gotti. Kill him. That's how Vinny solved problems. Yeah. And I understand from hearing. I don't know if it's true that Vinny. I think this is what Joe went back to the FBI with. Vinny was planning to kill uh, uh, Paulie. What was the prosecutor's name? Greg Andre. Greg Andre. I mean, from what I understand, he already knew where he ate every Wednesday, Tuesday night, whatever it was, and. Joe repeated this to the FBI, and I think they wired him up, and uh, Vinny had that much trust in him to tell him. And uh, this is how Joe wound up uh, cooperating. Cause they, I, I think they were against Joe cooperating, but he convinced them about getting Vinny gorgeous. And then last question, we're going to end with one more question. Uh, art imitating life or life imitating art, from your perspective, what is the best movie or television show that depicts the life that you led most accurately? The Godfather. <laughs> that was, it was something that you can, do you remember watching it? Do you remember hearing uh, yeah. people within your orbit kind of saying how authentic it was? Uh, yeah, I, well, it, what, it, what, listen, I, I go, I'm 77, Scott, so I go back, my mentor was 92, Al Walker, so I go back to those traditional old timers like The Godfather was in the movie where you did things in the neighborhood to help people help her save her apartment, you know, that's what I miss in, in, the, in the life. I love the life, I still do, where you're able to help people, Scott. What took place behind closed doors, that was our business because you joined the club and you knew the rules, like me. I, I had an incident where they, uh, I had an argument with Vinnie Gorgeous in the courtroom. They broke up the trial for a few minutes, took me in the back, and the prosecutor said, what is wrong with you? You're, you're going to... You're going to put Vinny in jail. That's your, your way you get. I said, no, you see, you got it all wrong. I said, I don't want to put Vinny in jail. You do. I said, in my cooperating, if that's the end result, but it's not that I want to go after Vinny. So, uh, you know, I made it clear. I did not leave my balls at the door. I am still the same guy. You know what I mean? Beautiful. Uh, I, 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 I'm being honest with you, Scott. I am still the same man. I, 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 I let me put it this way. A lot of guys walk in a room and they think when they get straightened out, now they're tough guys. Well, I'm going to say something to you. Might, I, I was born tough. <laughs> uh, not that I push people around, but I was born tough. Um, I don't take lightly and never in my life did I ever get pushed around. Never. But I did not go and bother nobody. I'm not a bully or anything.
Richie, this was great. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You've done it. You've said it all. This is one of the best interviews I've ever done. Hopefully it's the, you know, the start of a beautiful friendship between myself and you and your son. And I can't thank you enough for, for giving me the honor to, to, to interview you. I look forward to talking to you again. Be safe. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good 4th of July. Bye-bye. You too, buddy. Well, that was just one amazing storyteller there. You got it right from the horse's mouth. The OG of OGs from the Bonanno crime family, Richie Cantarella. We didn't get into the nickname uh, Richie Shellackhead, but uh, from talking to him off the air, I heard that uh, no one really called him Richie Shellackhead on the street. It was a name that was given to him by some guys, I believe, in the in the newspaper world that would reference him to each other because he, he put a lot of shellac uh, in his hair. But uh, Richie Cantarella, again, I'm just so honored that, that he took the time to sit with us and, and tell his story. And that's what we do here on the OG Podcast. Uh, we're, we're giving you the most authentic stories from the most authentic people. And uh, I was so glad that we could share this with you. We'll be back next week. I'm Scott Bernstein for Jimmy Bucciolato, OG Media, OG Podcast out.